My brother's been missing for a long time now. I've looked all over the house and all around the garden and even a little down by the beach. It's a windy day today and I have to squint and shield my eyes as I scan the long grass and sands of the coast. The sky is a total gray and the sea looks rough and cold. He won't have gone into the water. I'm not worried about that. He doesn't like the sea, but I am starting to get a bit concerned nonetheless. My name is Everly. I live here in our little house with my mom and dad and my little brother Emmett. He doesn't normally wander off, but he does like to explore. Confident that he isn't anywhere in or around the house, I shiver against the wind and set out further down the beach, away from the wild grass and onto the stones and sands, heading down the slopes that lead to the sea. Emmett, I call out, my voice quickly lost in the wind. Emmett, but I don't think he can hear me. I call out for him again, searching through the long, thin grasses at the edge of the sandbank, looking to see if he's made himself a den or a hideout or something. But I don't think he has, in truth. I can't help but feel like I know where it is that he's gone. My feet are already carrying me there, slowly but steadily, down the length of the beach and towards the rocks and cliffs that roll from the edges of the hills, rising up and up above our heads. Emmett, I call. Our parents always warned us never to go towards the cliffs, that it's dangerous, and the tide makes it downright deadly. But that's exactly where I'm heading. It's where Emmett has gone, I'm sure of it. The allure is too great. It starts to creep into view as I clamber over the tumbled rocks, between the walls of the cliffside, nestled between the corners and stony walls, a great, dark fissure in the rock and sediment, a passage, a secret tunnel, the secret tunnel leading away into the excitement of the unknown in the depths of the cliff. My feet splash in the froth of the sea as I shamble awkwardly down towards it. We've often talked about it, Emmett and I, joked and wondered about what we might find inside were we to go exploring. A mystical world? Pirate's treasure, perhaps? The skeleton of an ancient sea monster? Or maybe even a sleeping mermaid? I grimace and furrow my brow with anxiousness as I imagine Emmett coming down here all by himself, Maybe I was dumb for fantasizing with him. What if all I did was encourage him to venture out alone? The fissure looms dark and tall as I approach. I have to keep a hand to the side of my forehead to keep my hair from blowing and whipping into my eyes in the wind. Am I really going to do this? Am I really going to go inside? But I have to. I have to at least take a look. So I peer inside. The wind echoes around the wet rock walls. Emmett? I call down into the gloom, but the sound is quickly absorbed into the tunnel. There's enough light to see, so I creep on inside, carefully stepping around wave-smoothed rocks and splashing lightly through the water at my shoes, leaving the wail of the weather behind me. The feeling of the wind against my skin lessens immediately and significantly. Its sound becomes a backing rumble that replaces its roaring rush, and my hair, once it's tied up, actually keeps its place. I call out for my brother again, cautiously, and in a quieter voice. Why quieter, Everly? It's not a question I can answer. The tunnel gets smaller as it winds into the gloom, and towards its far end it rounds a sharp corner. I'm only small, but I still have to crouch and squeeze my way through the gap in the rock here before I can continue on along my way. So with a grunt of effort, I push myself through, stumbling and landing in a slightly deeper pool of cave water on the other side one that comes almost up to my knees. It's cold. I shiver and climb up onto the stone, looking ahead down the natural corridor that leads away before me through the cliff. There are lights down there, I notice, blue and dim, but shimmering. And how could I ignore them? I clamber across the rock and stone down to the end of the passageway. Lifting my gaze reveals the source of the light, and it looks like a little, well, like a little lantern, almost fixed into the stone and glowing a faint but pleasant pale blue. Hello, says a small voice just behind and below me. Are you lost, little girl? My heart jumps in surprise, but I'm not scared as I turn around. The voice didn't sound scary. I look down to see a small blue man looking back up at me. He can't be taller than knee height, and he has large eyes and long fingers. Toes, too. And they're all webbed. He looks like he could be covered in scales but I sigh that it might be a bit rude to ask about that. Hi, I reply. It's nice to meet you. 
No, I'm not lost. I'm just looking for my brother. It's nice to meet you too. The little man beams up at me. Your brother, you say? What's his name? His name is Emmett. He looks kind of like me, but he's younger and shorter. His hair is darker. Have you seen him come by? The little blue man rubs his chin in thought as the light behind me flickers. No, he says eventually, putting up his shoulders in an apologetic shrug. But he still might have come through. Would you like to take a look with me? We can ask some of the others. Are there others like you? I ask him, and he smiles. Oh, yes. And he puts out his little hand. My name is Og, by the way. What's yours? He'll know the layout of the tunnels. He can be a guide to help me find Emmett. I smile back and take his little hand in my own. It feels cold and a bit slimy, but I don't say anything as I don't want to offend him. My name is Everly. Nice to meet you, Og. He leads me around a rock and through another lamp-lined tunnel, and the passage quickly widens out into an enormous cavern, illuminated with pale blue and flickering orange from all over. Whoa, I murmur in awe, staring wide-eyed all around at the scene before me. Towering columns of inner cliff rock have been carved into buildings and bridges by way of arches and grooves and tiny doorways, and hundreds upon hundreds of little blue men and women wave to us as we pass them by. Some pull tiny carts full of shimmering stones. Some chip away at the base of a boulder with miniature pickaxes. I'll be able to help you for maybe 10 or so minutes, the man says as he nods at a passerby, then looking up to me. Then I'll have to get back to work, I'm afraid. So what do you do? I ask. Are you a builder like those guys? Stop getting distracted, Everly. Remember, you're looking for Emmett. Oh my, no. I look after our friend Carquino. He needs lots and lots of help to stay healthy, so that's what I do. Who's Carquino? I ask, standing on tiptoes for a moment to peer over a large stone, one carved in such a way as to resemble an ancient, if a tad blocky, church. He lives here with us, below the cliffs, says Og. We keep him happy, and we all look after him. A gentle rumble passes through the stone beneath our feet. Is he like you? I ask. Carquino, I mean. The little blue man chuckles. Goodness me, no, he smiles. No, he isn't. Would he know where to find my brother? I ask. No, Og replies. I shouldn't think that he would. And besides, he doesn't usually like to be disturbed. Huh? I reply. Carquino? Og glances down to an intricate, shiny little timepiece attached around his wrist. Goodness me, he starts. I have less time than I thought. I'm sorry, Everly. I'm going to have to go. I do hope you find your brother. Feel free to ask around. I'm sure anybody would be happy to help. He takes off at a jog, turning around to wave back at me as he winds his way through waist-high, stony passages. Bye, I call after him, raising a hand and goodbye. Hmm. He's a curious guy, but he reminds me that there's a lot going on down here that I don't understand and I would be smart to just find Emmett, and then maybe come back another day. All around me now, the little people are nodding and smiling and waving at me as they go about their business. They're so much bigger up close, one says to her friend, then scuttles away into shadow when I turn to look at her. Her friend shrugs and apologizes. Sorry about her, she's never seen a human so close before. It's okay, I tell her. Hey, do you think you could help me? I'm looking for my brother. He's a human too. Have you seen anyone like me come through today? The two young blue ladies look at each other in silence, a silence which hangs for a moment in the air before the more confident of the two chooses to speak. Yes, I saw another human, a boy. He was exploring a short while ago. Really? I exclaim with excitement. Where did he go? Did you see? She shakes her head. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I was a little deeper into the cavern, though. He liked looking at all the lights. The lights, right. Got it, thank you. I bow a little in thanks and hurry away through the city of shiny inner cliff stone. The small blue people tip their hats to me and wave as I pass them by. I see fewer and fewer of them as I go deeper into the cavern. Where is he? If he came down here, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Did that blue girl mean for me to go this far? I stand on my tiptoes and peer over the columns and carvings of stone, looking this way and that and I almost step right into a little man just in front of me. 
Whoa there! He chuckles, and I jump back at once. Oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I should have been looking where I was going. It's all right, young lady. Don't fret now, he says, and like the others, he tips his hat. Where would you be running off to at a time like this? I'm just looking for my brother, I say, for what feels like the hundredth time. I'm just starting to get a little worried about him, is all. Well now, there's really nothing to worry about, the blue man replies. If he's down here, then he's perfectly safe. In fact, I tell you what, there's a big ceremony tonight. It's a little ways back there on the other side of the town. Big light show and lots of special guests. Carquino himself will be there. I imagine if you're going to find your brother, then tonight's show is a safe bet. After all, he shouldn't be too difficult to spot. We don't get many humans down here, after all. Oh, I see. Thank you. Whereabouts? The little man gives me directions and the time, then tips his hat to me in farewell. Just don't be late. In fact, you'd be smart to show up a little early. Find a good place for yourself to sit and to keep an eye for your brother. Yes, great. I'll head back into town right away. Just let me tie up my shoe and maybe I'll see you there. He nods. Maybe you will. Take care, young lady. He picks up the handles of his cart and sets off about his business, winding his way through the stone streets into the gloom, his wet, long-toed feet slapping slightly onto the rock. I finish tying up the laces of my shoe. The string is all wet and frayed, but it's okay. I can always replace them. I stand back up and am about to do as I said I would to head back into the center of the town and wait for the evening show, but something catches my eye out there in the darkness, away from the gentle sounds of the bustle off to my right. Far off in the shadows of the enormous cavern are a series of faint and flickering lights, orange and red, subtle at first, and I only notice them due to the movement, but there they are, flashing behind a high and rounded ridge of rock. The lights. I chew my tongue in thought and decide to go after them. I'll just have a quick check before I turn back. I might as well. The way ahead gets progressively more difficult, and darker too. There are no little people here to help guide my way, only tumbled stone and awkward rockscape. It also soon becomes clear that I misjudge the distance of the lights, but I've committed now. I should just keep on going. As I climb and scramble, I also realize that I'm traveling in a rough, wide arc around the far edge of the town. The lights finally start to get closer and brighter, and I begin to hear a murmuring too. A gentle, woeful noise, and the tiny hairs across my forearms all rise with sudden anxiety. I jump down from a little ledge to the base of a wide, tall rim of stone. Looking up reveals that this is the rounded ridge I saw from afar, and the flashing red and orange lights spill tantalizingly over the top above me. I would need to climb up higher to see over, though. I choose instead to push aside my newfound fears and creep quietly around the edge, around this wall of rock. So staying low and sticking to the shadows, I do just that, cautiously sneaking from stone to stone. I don't know why I'm so suddenly afraid, but I put trust in my instincts. My breathing seems loud in the darkness. Round and round I go, the rocks become more jagged and they give way to a series of carved platforms, a collection of ledges each with a small, boxy room carved into their sides. But there's a boy in one of them. And not just any boy. It's Emmett. I slam a hand to my mouth in shock. I can see my brother. He is yet to notice me. But he is squished up with his arms wrapped around his legs, clearly uncomfortable in what now looks more like a prison cell than a room. Squinting confirms this. I can see a series of bars keeping him locked in place. I creep quickly up to his cell. The others are empty, and I tap the metal. He grunts as he turns his head to look at me, and his eyes go wide. Everly, he says, and I shush him at once. Everly, you gotta get me out of here, he hisses. I can't move here. My arms and shoulders hurt so much. What did you do, Emmett? I ask him, glancing anxiously around. Why did they lock you up in here? I didn't do anything, I promise. Please, just get me out. How? Where are the keys? I don't know. Look, the bars are only thin. Are you able to move them? My hands are stuck and I can't reach out, but you might be able to. I lean back and rub my chin and thought, eyebrows furrowed. Emmett's cell only has three bars and they're actually pretty far apart. The first two bars don't budge at my shaking, but the third has a little give. 
I look closer, trying hard to see in the dim, reddish light thrown from the rim of the stone wall overhead and behind, and I realize that the bar is loose at the top where it connects to the stone. I look around me again, expecting to be caught at any second, and I start to shake the bar forwards and backwards. It doesn't go very far at first, but little stones start to fall and crumble from the rock until it finally gives way with a rusty crack. I cringe at the noise, fumbling with the fallen bar to keep it from landing hard on the ground at my feet. But I don't think anyone heard. Nobody comes running, at least. Emmett grunts and whimpers in pain as he scooches himself sideways and through the newly provided gap in the cell. He is pressed up against the rock, and the remaining central bar turns his skin white as he pushes past it. I grab his sleeve and help to pull him out, but he can't keep himself from slipping and stumbling and landing with a thud against the stone as he falls his arms and legs too cramped to jump so quickly back into life. It hurts, he groans, gritting his teeth and trying to stretch out one of his shaking arms. The lights have begun to brighten in intensity. Our shadows darken and I look up to their source. Noises have begun to grow from behind the massive, circular walls of stone. A general murmuring, growing into a clamor with shouts and laughs and cheers. Oh my goodness, I whisper. They're all here. They're all behind this wall. We gotta go, Everly. We have to go right now. But they seem so friendly, Emmett. Are you sure that you didn't... I didn't do anything, okay? Okay, shh. Be quiet. I believe you. I just... I just don't understand. A voice warbles from behind the Great Wall. A real treat for you tonight, ladies and gentlefolk of the cavern. A triple helping. That's right. Not one, not two, but three special friends will be introduced to Carquino, and I'm sure he's just aching to meet them. This voice, louder than the rest, is met with a rumble of cheers and roars. My heart starts to pound. I grab Emmett's sleeve and begin to drag him around the edge of the wall, through the rough and tumbled rock and shadow. He does his best to keep up, though he stumbles on his aching legs. Something is wrong down here. Something is very, very wrong. Around we go, until we reach the great and rounded wall's stony end. To our left lies the vast, rocky shadows of the cavern perfect for sneaking through, undetected. But the way is blocked by a dark, deep fissure in the ground. Ahead and just to the right are pale blue lights of the town, with what I believe to be the cavern's entrance at the very far side. And to our immediate right, to our immediate right are a series of stone steps and crags. I look up. I could climb them to the top of the wall, get a look at what's going on if I wanted. But more importantly, I could climb from the wall to a nearby outcrop of stone, jump and crawl across and shimmy down into the shadows on our left. We could leave without being seen as long as we were careful at this first part. It's either that or head directly through the town or retrace our steps, I guess. I share my thoughts with Emmett as the crowd roars. I ask him about how he feels to climb. He winces and stretches his joints with little pops and cracks, but nods and agrees. We're going to climb up, across, and then down and slink through the shadows. So with a deep breath, I clamber up, step by step. I reach down a hand to help Emmett as we draw nearer the top of the ridge. The lights are much brighter here, the noise much louder. I hear cheering and whooping and shouts of praise and glee, and there's a smell too. Something thick and metallic that makes me want to gag. We sit perched, Emmett and I, waiting for a particularly loud cheer. In that moment, I give my brother an encouraging push and he makes the little jump to the outcrop of stone. He lands with a grunt but shoots over a thumbs up, creeping across it on his belly before turning and climbing down on the other side of the fissure into the safety of the shadows. I'm about to do the same, preparing to jump when a new wave of shouts and screams of delight wash over the rim of the wall, a new burst of that strange, sickly smell. And I admit it, I am too curious. I have to have a look, just one quick look. So before I jump across, I raise myself up on shaking knees, doing my best to stay hidden, but peering over the top of the rock wall to see what lies behind. My eyes widen in despair at what I see. The heights of stone, which appear as just a rounded rocky wall from the outside, are revealed as the tiered layered walls of a stadium, a stadium full of the little blue townspeople. They sit in rows that go way, way down to a huge, red-orange illuminated pit deep below us. 
the great Carquino has been carved into the stone of one of the walls. And below us, below the cheering and crowds, is Carquino himself, I can only presume. Carquino is monstrous, enormous, black and gray, with markings of white and cold icy blue. He is an armored beast, a terrible crab-like cave dweller with spiked and dripping flesh visible in the cracks of his shell. His eyes are black and soulless and swivel of their own accord on slimy, searching stalks. His sharp, serrated claws strike down, and with an accompanying fresh burst of that metallic, sickly smell, it gores into the ruined, crushed and torn apart body of what could have only been a human. The fleshy mass shudders as its ligaments are ripped away from its torso with a spout and a splash of dark, flowing blood and Carquino shovels the oozing biomatter into his mouth, gnashing and gnawing and grinding as the tendons snap and peel away, as his colossal legs clack against the dark stained stone, and crunch and squish into piles of surrounding bones and gray decaying flesh. The crowd roars in delight, salivating and screaming, their eyes wide with fulfillment and red in the reflected light of the arena, stark against the blue of their skin. Shivering, I slowly lower myself back down below the rim of stone. I do as Emmett had done, and we make our way over the fissure and through the shadows at the edge of the town. It's all blurry, this part, but I remember leaving the cheering behind us, the red lights of the arena, and the pale blue of the town and the lamps. We were able to find our way back to the little pool, and we squeezed ourselves back through the gap in the corridor of tight rock. I remember the way the moonlight filtered in through the great crack at the end of the passage, and the way that the sea looked so much calmer. The gentle froth and soothing waves shone silver in the dark night air. I didn't say a word for the rest of the day, or the day after for that matter. My parents were so worried. Emmett thought he understood, but he didn't really. I don't think he knew what would have happened to him had I not found him locked up in that stony cell. My desperate pleas for us to move away, I hope, are slowly chipping away at my parents' resolve, but I fear every night that it won't be fast enough, because I see them in my nightmares, the little blue people, and Carquino, waiting, waiting down in the darkness below the cliffs. I check for the hammer I've been keeping under my pillow before I fall asleep, as I always do, and I lay awake in the darkness, trying to keep the sounds of the stadium from my head. Emmett and I are both a little more cautious about our adventures these days.